Does feel good to be a child of God today, huh? Ooh, all right. Well, that was. Uh, you guys are so great at worshiping. I saw, like the kids. This this dance crew has just grown. Now they're like a lap crew. They're running around. They're jumping. Like this is just great. So, uh, well, thank you all for being here this morning. It's so good to see you all. Um, if you could just, you know, turn and greet your neighbor and thank them for being here and introduce yourself safely, of course, and we'll get ready to uh, kind of move into uh, the message from Pastor Jim. I know it's going to be great, so um, thanks for being here today. So cool. I think it would be a good song for y'all to do at my funeral. Yeah. Gonna live again. Yeah. Yeah. Yelling and dancing while get our little jumping, running worship team to do laps. <laughs> hey, Amen. I mean, that's, that's quite a declaration, you know. Wow. Well, praise the Lord. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. <laughs> Better now than ever. 
Karen's dad just said, I feel better all over more than anywhere else. <laughs> so what color is it really? Same as Dr. Angela's hoodie, I think. Is it rose? I don't know. Hmm? Pink? Mauve? Okay. Real men can wear a fuchsia. Is that what it is? Fuchsia, maybe. I don't know. I need to go over to Sherwin Williams and have him scan me. So, what is this really? All righty. Well, let me see announcements this week. We have prayer tonight at 5. Bingo! Courtney's up in the booth. There it is. Is that me? That is me. That's not me. Kind of looks like me. All right. And what else are we announcing? I don't have my doodad right here. I think we might actually have somewhat of a slow week this week. Huh? Oh, okay, well. Yep, I think we're good. Be okay. Be nice to uh, have a little bit of a slow week this week, but amen. All right, hey, it's offering time. Good to see you. Well, we have guests today. I should behave myself. Good to have you guys here today. And it's always like this. Amen. Well, we praise the Lord. You know, you guys are amazing when it comes to giving. You know, these are crazy times. And, you know, it's funny, during this pandemic, a lot of businesses really prospered. You know, like the Home, home Depot and that, those places really prospered because people were at home and they had a little extra stimulus money to rather than to live on and keep them from starving there, putting in new bathroom, new countertops, and all those kinds of things. So those businesses boomed. But others in, like, the food industry, you know, no job, or maybe their business is gone. So kind of uh, been a crazy year. But here's the thing. No matter how nutty it gets, when we can connect our economic value system with God, there's something special that happens there because the Lord doesn't look at the pandemic and go, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? with these people. He, he's the provider. He's still our Jehovah Jireh. And uh, one of the best ways to do that is just have a generous heart, just to be able to uh, share with what you have, and not just to be a good tithe payer or offering giver at church, but just in general in our whole lives. You know, many years ago, uh, about actually over 100 years ago, at least uh, back around 100 years ago, Springfield, Ohio was the number one manufacturing city in the world next to one town in one city in Germany. We manufactured more than anybody. You know, all those old gigantic warehouse buildings that you see along the railroad tracks out on the east side, um, you know, out there. <clears throat> like start if you started it at maybe at the railroad tracks at Burnett Road and then went all the way to the center of Springfield. In fact, all the way past that, all the way out to the, the west side of town, just tons and tons right now of abandoned huge factories that were there. And we manufactured more. We're the second largest manufacturing city in the world, bigger than Chicago, New York, anything, and then uh, all the, the manufacturing around the world. <clears throat> but... Just some, a spirit of lack and greed and selfishness and weirdness uh, came on some of our city leaders back in the day <clears throat> that were making decisions about those kind of things. Henry Ford was a young rascal with a good idea how to, um, uh, how to uh, mass produce uh, automobiles and said, I need a place to put my factory. And he met up with our leaders here in the city and said, I'd like to build cars here. And... Unfortunately, our city leaders moved by a spirit of, I think it was a spirit of lack, greed, selfishness. They said, well, we don't want to pay our people in Springfield what you pay your people. So you can just, you know, take your great idea on down the road. So they went up to Detroit, and Ford Motor Company makes awesome pickup truck, the F-150s. More of those than there are of people, I think, or close to it. I mean, millions and millions and millions of them. 
And from that time, Springfield just declined and declined. All these harvesting companies, except for IH, the only one that survived, went and mass foos and just, I mean, you could just go to the Ohio history uh, online and just look at the, some of the amazing things that were going on. Just declined way, 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 way down. And it's such a sad thing because there is, you know, if Henry Ford wants to come in town and pay someone some huge wage, that doesn't mean you're taking away from somebody else, man. You're making, you know, in uh, at same dollars, billions of dollars worth of of economy coming into an area. The whole area is raised up. It's not like one piece of the pie. If you take, you know, there's only so much pie, and if you do this, uh, you know, zero, what do they call it, a zero-sum game, it's not that way. So you got, we have to break that mentality. So anyhow, something Springfield has dealt with for the last 100 years, getting out of that poverty mentality, that there's just not enough to go around, and, oh, what are we going to do? We better take care of ourselves. And, you know, honestly, just in the last few years, Things are beginning to change. We see our downtown beginning to be revitalized. We've had people from Columbus come here and build the cohatch, and what's cooking down there is an amazing thing. I got a report the other day from a guy, and he told me I can't tell anybody, but some amazing development that's going to be happening in Springfield and Clark County. People from out of this area that said there's something special about Springfield. We want to invest there. And so, yeah, we don't have to have a brain drain anymore. So all of our young people, when they get their education, they move to Cincinnati or Dayton or Columbus or something because there's nothing going on in town. But God's changing things. And I think it's you and I that need to be, just like anything else really, to be that spiritual force to break the back of that nasty spirit of lack and poverty and whining and complaining, you know, oh my gosh, we just need to uh, have on our lips this the confession, you know, how's it going, man, I can't go under for going over, and God's taking care of me, and, you know, uh, just uh, have that in our, not just in our mouth, but in our heart, just to really believe that. God wants to bless our city, and then speak that over our town, too. Say Springfield is a city of God, Springfield is prospering, Springfield is growing, People are going to come to Springfield to have their baby's barn. Amen. Springfield, people come to Springfield to build their uh, hotels and their convention centers and those kind of things. Why? Because there's a positive attitude and a positive feel and atmosphere. It's happening, but we're just, I think, on the cusp of it to kind of reverse what's happened over the last hundred years. And Jesus tarries for the next hundred years Just see it grow and grow and grow. So, amen. Well, anyhow, a little sermon there for free. But you are good examples of generosity and giving. So we're going to receive offering. There's so many ways you can give. It's right up there. And we do have a basket in the back if you like uh, using pictures of Ben and pictures of uh, Andrew Jackson and all. You can put those in the basket. And, uh, yeah. Well, Lord, we thank you for helping us and taking care of us during these crazy economic times. And Lord, we're looking forward to soon seeing this uh, pestilence leave our country and leave the world, people to be healthy and not having to just uh, be so careful about spreading germs and all, just to be able to get our minds back to normal there. But then the economic part of all that brought, we just want to see that curse reverse, Lord. And for everything the enemy stole, we just want to claim back sevenfold into the lives. For those that are here in our congregation that are looking for work, need a job, or need a boost in their income, Lord, just look upon them. Give them a divine inspired idea, favor with uh, with uh, whoever's hiring. Maybe they want to start their own business. Give them the insight to be able to do that. So we just praise you for taking care of us, Lord. We do ask and pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. <coughs> Amen. Well, it's time to get into the Word. I'm looking forward to our message today, a scripture that's one of my favorites in the Bible. It's one of those odd verses and passages, just uh, seven verses, that you wonder, why is this even in the Bible? It's kind of peculiar, a little bit weird, but to me, very interesting. And uh, so we're going to read the story about the prophets, the sons of the prophets that uh, were... uh, getting ready to build a house, and some things weren't going quite their way. And so uh, let's just read a little bit about that here. This is in 2 Kings chapter 6. It'll be right there on the screen. So the disciples of the prophets said to Elisha, the place where we're staying is too small for us. So let's go to the Jordan River. Each of us can get some logs and make a place for us to live there. Elisha said, go ahead. 
And then one of the disciples asked, uh, won't you please come with us? Then Elisha answered, I'll go. So he went with them, and they came to the Jordan River and began to cut down trees. So they needed a bigger place, and it was just getting a little small. They had too much junk, or maybe they had a few extra guys came along. It was just not enough room. So uh, they went down, and uh, we, what verse are we ready for? Five. So as one of them, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water. So this guy's chopping away, and all of a sudden, the axe head went flying. I don't know if he went back like this and went that way into the river, or if he went like that and went that way into the river. But anyhow, the axe head flew off of the handle, and he cried, out, oh, no, master, it was borrowed. You know, and here's the thing. You think, what's the big deal? You can buy an axe for $40, $50, good one, cheap one for 12 bucks or something. What's the big deal, you know, if an axe falls apart? But you got to realize that back in those days, owning an axe, especially a, a, an iron head axe, was like owning a whole tree company. You see these guys running around town, you know, tree company, like these gigantic pickup trucks and gigantic chippers. And they have, the, the, uh, they have a thing now called a, I think it's called a spider. Maybe it's a crab. But anyhow, it's, just, it's a little tiny, it's like a go-kart that they can, like, drive through your yard, go through the gate, and get between all your shrubs. Then when they get in the backyard, they spread these great big legs out like some kind of a transformer, and they can lift this guy like 100 feet in the air. So cool. Yeah. Chainsaws and, and all kinds of lifts and things. And so when this guy lost his axe, it's like throwing the whole tree company into the water. Oh, master, it was borrowed. So, uh, so the man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed Elisha the place, Elisha cut off a piece of wood, took a branch, threw it into the water at the place, and it made the axe head float. So Elisha said, pick it up, and the disciple reached for it and picked it up. So that's the story. That's all there is in the scripture about this. But to me, it's just, it's just cool. You know, it's just, it's like, oh, you could almost make a, a little Three Stooges short on this thing. It's just almost funny the way it happened. And then the way that the problem was resolved, you just take, you know, it goes in the water. How are we going to get it out? And the guys were probably ready to jump in and start fishing around. They say the Jordan River is not terribly deep, but it's real mushy on the bottom and be a terrible thing to lose it. He probably wasn't paying attention when it went flying. Maybe no one saw exactly where it went. I mean, they knew approximately where did it go. And he just throws a limb in and all of a sudden this axe head King James said it was swimming, which is kind of cool. Might have, who knows what? But it was floating. And, you know, it just doesn't happen. You might be able to float a gum wrapper, you know, a little aluminum gum wrapper if you do it just right. But not an axe head. So it's just kind of a, a cool story and uh, very interesting to me. And I'm glad things worked out for that guy. Uh <laughs> So, uh, so what the, the point today, and you see on your bulletin cover, you saw on the marquee coming in, the title of the message is, Have You Lost Your Edge? And so um, it's, what we want to look at here is these guys, they went down to get a job done. They had a nice tool, so it's a nice sharp axe, and they're chopping away, and everything's going fine until there was a problem. And then suddenly, this guy's just standing there with the axe handle, and there's a problem. And so, and then nothing much is going to happen. You can't get much work done that way. And, well, I tell you what, we have a demonstration. You probably noticed we had some logs up here. And Rob, who is president of Maple, is it Maple Wood? Maple Wood. Maple Woods. Is it industry or incorporated or hmm? enterprise? He, uh, where we keep our, you know, we keep our axes up here on this stand. And so Rob uh, brought me one of his axes. So <laughs> a little different kind of axe. And that's a real one. So you want to stand down here and do it? Is it better angle for you? So I just want, that thing is really sharp. Uh, Rob put an edge on that thing that's, it's scary sharp. Yeah, don't even, you could probably shave with that. It's, it's sharper, sharper than it should be. But anyhow, if you want to just, yeah, I mean, it's, but uh, uh, Matt is a, 
Eagle Scout, and so he said it may not last a long time, but it sure will cut as long as it lasts. So anyhow, Rob, just uh, go ahead. I'm going to stand over here in case the egg head flies off. <laughs> and, ooh, oh, I knew we'd make a mess. Bam. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> that was, that we really got. Hey, take a whack at that one over there. It might be a little more solid. Oh, there you go. Well, I tell you what, I think we proved our point. Now, where do I stand? Here, won't you, yeah, go ahead. Very good. All right, good thing we had a little piece of protection up there. To, so, Rob, if you want to throw that bad boy up there. Now, so anyhow, with a scary, sharp axe, that's the kind of uh, what you can do. But in the story, the axe head flew off, so we have another axe with a problem. That is the axe handle. So, uh, won't you see how good you... <laughs> yeah, see, careful, Wes, that's really sharp. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, yeah, well, it's making a mess, but, but anyhow, you get the point. You're not, gonna, you're not going to build a prophet's quarters. Thank you, Robert. You can just... Rob and I are fans of Forged in Fire. I love, by the way, I love the 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 cover for the uh, bulletin. It was a guy grinding an axe on a on a wheel. That's really super cool. So, so anyhow, there you go. You're not gonna think about this. If those guys are getting ready to build a log cabin, a bigger place to live, and all he had was this thing right here, you know, he's just gonna be whacking away and not getting anything done. Big and make a nice noise, whack, whack, whack. Uh, lots of sweat, lots of calluses, but not many wood chips flying. So, <laughs> but we're talking about our lives. And so we look at the church these days, and the church is an awesome organism, more than an organization. The church is an organism. But then you look in the book of Acts, and you see Peter and John just as a lame man. They just jerked this guy up. Off the ground, he's healed. He hadn't walked all of his life, and he's healed. And we see uh, uh, Peter walking along, and his shadow was uh, so much of the presence of God that people were being healed. And the Apostle Paul could cast out devils without even going there. He'd just send his handkerchief or an apron, and miracles were happening. And um, and then you, someone like even like Elisha to be able to throw a twig in and the axe had come floating. So anyhow, we see things like this and we think, man, I wish we would see that kind of glory and that kind of presence and that kind of power uh, in, the, in the body of Christ. It could be in your life personally that maybe there was a day it seemed like all you had to do is just say Jesus and the presence of God came on you and you were bold about witnessing, and you just felt good about your relationship with God, and you seem like you've lost your edge, you know, and it's more like trying to get some work done with one of these right here. I, I heard a pastor say once that a lot of uh, pastors have just tossed the axe handle in the woods and just and left the forest because, you know, you try to do the work of God without an edge, uh, you're not going to get much uh, accomplished. And so that's kind of what we want to talk about today. Uh, we can strategize, we can motivate, we can organize, and if it, and things may not be clicking for us. In fact, it's a funny thing that if you ask most churches that have entered, I'm just uh, local churches, if you talk to one of those who just had an explosive growth, maybe they're a little church of 100 people and they've been that way for 50 years, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 things just start clicking. They end up with thousands of people coming, real revival, all these people saved and healed. And you ask them, so what's the difference? What did you do? And they'll go, I don't know. It's just God. It's just God is just, just doing this. What, what is, what's up with that? But, uh, and let me say this, you know, the story about Mary and Martha, uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus listening to his teaching while Martha was in the kitchen. As I said, I kind of, uh, I kind of identify with Martha, like, hey, I've got some work that needs to be done. Mary, get in here and help out. But Jesus said that Mary chose the more important part. So what we're seeing there is uh, 
when we feel like we're just making calluses and making noise and not getting anything uh, accomplished, you know, like where did the ax head go? You know, what do we do about it? And so you lo lost your edge. Maybe it's in your just your relationship with God. And that's mostly what we'll talk about. But it could be in your marriage. It could be with your business. Just something is just not clicking anymore. It just seems a little dull, a little boring. But uh, John chapter 6, Jesus said this, The Spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. So the Spirit, you know, which, by the way, is the, is the sword of the Lord. It's in the sword, but it's, it's sharp. And so the Spirit of the Lord is like a sword, but then the flesh counts for nothing. You know, this is just the, this is, this is the part of the ax that is the interface What's important is not just the axe head, but it's just that last, you know, that last eighth of an inch right there that has the edge on it that actually does the cutting. Of course, the weight's important in the way it's put together. But the rest of it's like an interface. And so, that thing smells like a mushroom. I wonder if you could fry that thing up. And Nah, we won't. I was walking through the woods with Andre in Russia. It was a gorgeous pine forest. It was amazing. And his son is picking up mushrooms. The son says, Dad, can I eat this mushroom? Andre said, well, you can, son, but you will die. So anyhow, you have to be careful what you're eating. Apostle Paul said, my... First Corinthians 2, 4, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And it's good to use your head. Wisdom is a good thing, but the wisdom of a man will not get the same results in our life that the wisdom and the power of God does. The Apostle Paul, you know, one of the people say, oh, Paul's an awesome speaker. Paul was this great preacher. Man, his sermon at Mars Hill was so amazing. He went in there and talked about the God that you don't know about and all this stuff. And you know what? There was nothing much happened there. There's no real fruit that we see in the Bible of what Paul did that day. So he moved on, and it when he got to the church at Corinth, things had changed. And he wasn't so much interested in how cute or how powerful or how well organized his message was. He said it's not about the words, but it's about the power and the demonstration. And we know that, the, in fact, the church at Corinth was just gung-ho wild over uh, spiritual manifestations and those kind of things. Probably even went overboard a little bit. So it's not... The wisdom of man. <clears throat> we can apply our brains. We can apply our thinking. We can study the Bible and memorize Scripture till we're blue in the face. But if it's not, it's, if it's not that relationship with God that really connects what we're doing, the the natural part of us, with what God can do in the Spirit, we're just going to be uh, making thump thump noises and uh, and getting tired and not getting any work done. Romans 8, 7 says, the mind is governed, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. So, and the flesh there doesn't mean necessarily sinful. It just means willful or uh, the, the uh, earthly part of us. So, a mind that's governed by just the natural is not, not just ineffective, but hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. That's why the Bible says to walk in the spirit. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh or the desires of the natural man. So then verse 9. So you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If, <clears throat> if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's a pretty hard preaching right there. He said, no, you're not in the flesh. You guys are in the spirit. Well, that is if the spirit's in you. If the spirit's not in you, you don't belong to Jesus. Like, oh, my gosh. Okay, got some sawdust in me. Just kidding. <laughs> fiber. You're supposed to eat fiber and not inhale it, so. <laughs> All right. 
So then, and then going on, 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So we do walk in the flesh, and there's no wrong, nothing wrong with that. You know, we are here, we are natural beings, we have this natural body, it's, a, it's amazingly, wonderfully made, the human body, the way that we function, the way, just the way that, uh, it, it's just amazing. You know, I love studying uh, nature and anatomy and just the way that uh, creatures uh, we're created. And so it's just an amazing thing. But that's just this part right here that is the natural. The part that's really going to get the work done is that edge right there, which is the sword of the Spirit. It's God's part. And so though we walk in the flesh, we don't fight or do warfare after the flesh. But the warfare, Rob was talking about this dream where these guys were we're in here worshiping, and they're at the door, beating on the door, protesting, causing trouble. And then as, you know, we didn't go out there and start fighting with them, slinging our fists and drawing our nine mils and all that stuff. But uh, you guys just kept right on worshiping. And I went out and must have shared the gospel because they got saved. And that's kind of a real image, a real uh, good type of how that spiritual warfare works. I remember, I uh, can't remember who the brother was, but he was a Jewish guy. And he, had a, he was in college, and he had a Christian friend. And this Christian friend just every day was after this Jewish guy to give his life to Jesus and was getting nowhere. And this Jewish guy was brilliant. He's just a real scholar. And he would just totally undress this guy with his arguments and the way he would come back. And, yeah, but the Bible says this, and this guy just would just blast him with his intellect and logic and all this stuff. And this poor kid was just worn out. And... Uh, but he just, he just kept loving this Jewish friend of his and kept being there for him and hanging out. And then finally, it wasn't long that this Jewish guy had a real revelation of who Jesus was, received Jesus as his Messiah, and got born again. They said, so what was it he said? What was it he did that, that persuaded you? And he goes, it wasn't any of that. He said, it was just the fact he loved me, and he loved me, and he loved me, and he loved me, and he just wouldn't give up on me. And finally, it just got me. That's like that sword of the spirit that cuts between the joints and the marrow and the, and the soul and the spirit goes all the way into the very intents of the heart. So you may not feel like you're so well equipped with, with your biblical knowledge or your ability to communicate. Some people are amazing communicators and other people, they can talk to you for two or three minutes and you kind of turn to your wife and say, what were they saying? I have no idea. He was good, though. I mean, I know people that are just, and they just kind of jump from one thought to another, and you're, what did they say? I don't know, but I, I like the guy. I have no idea what he, was I, I don't know. But anyhow, but some other people can just, just little quips and wisdom. They're so sharp, and their words are gorgeous. And you may not, you're probably not one of those. There are very few of those, actually. Um, this week, I guess it was this week that Rush Limbaugh passed away, and, uh, uh, that boy, that brother had the gift of gab. And uh, something <laughs> that uh, I, I guess he's been saying, he's been on the air for, what, 35 years or something. The one thing he used to say is that he is uh, on the air today with you with talent on loan from God. <laughs> boy, that guy's arrogant. But he was saying, but, but it's so true. We all, if you have any talent, to minister, to sing, to preach, to do business, to whatever it is, you're operating with talent on loan from God. So it's really a, a humbling thing to be able to admit that. But isn't that cool, though? That is how God wants us to operate, not out of our own ability. We have to be the willing vessel. We make ourselves available. If any of you ever heard Robbie Dawkins share his testimony about the first time he saw anyone healed in his ministry, Oh, my gosh, it's just so hilarious. I'll see if I can shorten this down just to a minute. <clears throat> but a lady called that. He said that every time he would, he was in a, a, like a Pentecostal church of some sort, but every time that he would pray for somebody, he was like the youth pastor there or the associate pastor. Every time he'd pray for someone, they would not get healed or they would get worse or they would die. In fact, it was like, you know, don't, whatever you do, don't have Dawkins pray for you if you don't want to die because people die when he prays for him. He said one day a lady called and said, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't go to church. We go maybe weddings, funerals, 
maybe at Christmas every once in a while. I don't know how this works, but my dad, uh, at heart is totally shot. His heart and lungs are destroyed, and he's going to die. And they don't think they can help him with surgery, but they're going to go in and take a look. And so uh, I would like for you to pray. And Dawkins actually told this lady, I, I don't want to pray for your dad because if I do, he'll die. It never works out for me. Uh, you know, and he actually told her that. And so she wouldn't lay off and just said, wouldn't you? You need to pray. You're a church, right? You're a preacher, so you should pray, right? And he goes, no, I, you know, it, I, it never works out. But anyhow, she just kept insisting on the phone. And I think because she didn't understand this, that he was totally stupid. You know, she just figured, you know, I'd call the church number this. Anyhow, Dawkins ends up just to get her off of the phone. So, oh, okay, Lord, just touch Dad and in the name of Jesus. And then he said, I don't know where it came from, but out of my mouth came, God's going to give your dad brand new heart and lungs. And he goes, well, where'd that come from? And so anyhow, she got off the phone, and um, I don't know if it was the next day, but a day or so later, phone rings again, and this, here's this woman on the roof. And he goes, what's the, name? what's the matter? What's the matter? What's going on? And just calm down, lady. You know what's going on? Well, it turns out it's that woman. And it's, okay, your dad died. I'm so sorry I told you not to have me pray. You know, it's, I'm sorry I told you not to have, have me pray because I knew he would die. No, he didn't die. He didn't die. Well, anyhow, what, the, what had happened is they went ahead to do the heart cath to go in and see what they had to do. And actually, wait a minute. Let me make sure I got my story straight. I believe they went ahead and opened him up. They must have opened him up because they went in and his heart, they said, who sent this guy in here to have this heart surgery? His heart is like, uh, in fact, it might have lined up with the word that Dawkins used, uh, but it was like a brand new heart, like a heart of a teenager, and which is weird because he had actually had a surgery previously where they put a pig valve in to keep him from dying, and they said, this is just like a brand new kid's heart, and, uh, and then they said uh, to about his lungs, he had actually had had part of one of his lungs removed, and he had all of his full lungs back in his chest, so anyhow, uh, so anyhow, Dawkins gets off the phone, Robbie Dawkins. I got a chance to meet him, hang, hang out with him, have lunch once. But anyhow, he's saying, so God, what's up with that? How could that even happen? I, I not only wasn't believing, I had no faith. I had a bad attitude. I, was, I want her off the phone and all this stuff. And then this amazing miracle took place in this woman's life. And the Lord just answered him right away and just says, because you were available. He was just totally... Uh, you know, he messed up. But God used him. Why? Because he said the words, you know, new heart, new lungs, and the name of Jesus. Now, get off the phone. Leave me alone. And so, uh, but he was available to pray that. So w the point of the story is that it's, that he's just, Robbie Dawkins is just one of these right here. You know, he just was offering the words, answering the phone, and uh, and leading this lady and then God did the work. God is the edge. The sword of the spirit is what does the cut. And so, uh, and how much more when we really do love God and we do trust him and we do believe uh, that he heals and, and does miracles, how much more when we'll make ourselves available to step out and, and offer a prayer? So, amen. So, Paul said, well, if the spirit of God's not in you. You don't belong to Jesus. But he said, but you're not that. You're with him. Jesus said, John 15, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Why? Because in the vines where it's getting the sap and uh, the nourishment from the, from the, that goes from the ground and the, the leaves and all that back and forth through this plant is you have to stay connected for that nourishment to happen, to bear fruit. And neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But remember, we're not apart from him. We are with him. And so, uh, like the axe head. What's the axe head of the church? What did I put here in my notes? Oh. I said sometimes our programs are the handles. Programs are okay. 
if God's in them, I mean, God can use programs and, and uh, ways to organize. And just like this, we have a building, we have a room, microphones and lights and chairs, and we have a meeting in here, and God uses this. But a lot of people don't have this. They do it different ways, and this works out. I just want to read a quote to you um, <clears throat> about people that, well, you, you'll get the, the feel of this. Better take a drink first. It's a couple paragraphs. Good stuff. All right. So, do we mourn that ours is a materialistic age? It's a guy named Ford actually writing this, not Henry Ford, but do we mourn that ours is a materialistic age? Would that it were only so on the scientific and rationalistic side. But what we have most reason to fear is that subtle materialism which is creeping into our church life and methods. How little different how little dependence is there on the supernatural power as all sufficient in our work? How much we are coming to lean on mere human agencies, upon art and architecture, upon music, rhetoric, and social attraction. If we would draw the people to church that we may win them to Christ, the first question with scores of Christians nowadays is, how can we turn, how, or what new turn can be given to the kaleidoscope of entertainment? What new sound in the keyboard? What uh, richer and more exquisite strain can be reached by the worship team? And what uh, fresh novelty in the way of social attraction can we induce? Or what new spark can be let off from the pulpit to dazzle and captivate people? Oh, for a faith to abandon utterly these devices of naturalism and to throw the church without reserve upon the power of the supernatural. And is there not some higher degree in the Holy Spirit's tuition into which we can graduate our young ministers instead of sending them to a university for their last touches of theological culture? Is there not some reserved power yet treasured up in the church, which is the body of Christ, or some unknown or neglected spiritual force which we can lay hold of and so get courage to fling away forever these frivolous experiences expedients on which we have so much relied for carrying on the Lord's work. One more line. The endowment of the Spirit for power, for service, for testimony, for success. I think, man, that guy's he's got the gift of eloquence. That's quite a quite a statement. But the funny thing about this message, this guy Ford, this is from Ford's Christian Repository from 1888. That thing's a, so 100 and whatever it is, 120, 40 years ago or whatever, they're saying, man, the church is worldly. Actually, I changed a few words. They didn't say a new, few new sounds on the keyboard. They talked about a few draw bars on the organ. And they didn't talk about the worship team. They talked about the choir. And that word from, for sparks coming off the pulpit, it's a word I'd never seen before, but <clears throat> it means sparks. So what's that mean? Sparks. But isn't that cool? Even back then they thought, man, how do, we, how do we walk into what we read about in the Bible? How do we really partake of it? So steps. We're going to give you a few steps here. Five steps to recovery to get our axe head back. So this guy, the first thing, you know, he, he, the axe head flew, and the first thing... <clears throat> he did was admit that he had lost the axe head. That may be something we need to do too. Rather than say, oh, well, you know, I don't, I'm just doing my best. I don't know where God is, what, what the problem is. Why isn't the Lord doing this, doing that? How about let's admit that we've lost our edge, that God is still on the throne and extremely well equipped. Someone said, we are apt to lose what we get loose and careless about. So it just takes... Some, you know, it's by grace, but it takes us applying ourselves, you know, checking in with our spirit, with our relationship with God. You know, it's something that if we just get loose and careless, it'll fade. We need to be diligent. Karen said, it, said any dead fish can swim downstream. But if you want to go upstream, you have to be alive. And uh, so we're not talking about just 
working in the flesh. We're talking about really applying ourselves to go after the things of the Spirit. So the second thing is he acknowledged that it was borrowed. We mentioned earlier about Rush saying he's, his talent is on loan from God. But that's uh, the only thing that's really worth, the only thing that really clicks and is, leaves a lasting effect in this life are the things that we really do in God and for God. A lot of things, we can build pyramids, but they'll say, I wonder who built this. Well, I think it's Kofu. I think it's this guy, but we really don't know. We think it was aliens. We really don't know, you know. But we know who Jesus is, and we know who Paul is, and we know who, you know, people just really stepped out and did great works uh, for the Lord. That's what I want to be, have a legacy in, in the Lord. Third thing, he was willing to return to where he lost it. It's kind of like Repentance. Oh, Master, it was borrowed. Okay, so where did it go? It went right over there. So he went back. To, you know, if, if you wonder when the sparkle faded from your life, you might just think back, Lord, when was the last time you asked me to do something and I pretty much either said no or just neglected to do it? You know, the Lord will lead us. He'll, he'll speak to us about this step or that step. And then for a sudden, like, eh, I don't think I want to do that. And suddenly we just find ourselves in a real slump. And we wonder, what's going on, Lord? And the Lord will remind us, well, what about, you know, a while back, I asked you to share a word with this person or spend a little time in prayer here or there, or give an extra dollar in the offering, and you just kind of blew it off. That, you know, we need to think about where do we lose it? Let's go back to where it went. He said it went right over there. And so, that's everything you do with our intimacy, doesn't it? Well, the fourth thing, he was willing to trust divine power for the recovery. In other words, he's, he went right straight to the prophet. Master, Elisha, it's lost. It was borrowed. What are we going to do? Can you imagine if you had this, you know, three or four pound, five pound axe hand will go flying in the water. And, you know, preacher, help me, let's do something. You know, we'd want to organize a little grid search out through the water, you know, get some nets and some snorkeling gear or something like that. But he takes a branch and he goes, whoosh, throws a little branch out on the water. It's like, oh, brother. But then the axe head started swimming. So it was a supernatural, supernatural solution to a natural problem. Someone said that uh, uh, it's just like the, the handle bashers are just about as bad as the water thrashers. You know, you're out splashing around. And, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Where's this thing? Where's this thing? And uh, again, we just can flip, flop, flip, flop until we're exhausted working in the flesh. Quick story. I don't know how many of you know who Dr. Uh, Isom Namey is, but he's a a doctor up in the Cleveland area, and he's a physician, but he's also a, uh, he prays for people, and they get healed. He's a Catholic guy, and he has healing meetings like every couple weeks, and hundreds of people show up because the results this man gets in laying on of hands uh, is just amazing, and someone said, what's it like to have so much faith? And he goes, well, it's not really faith because it just always happens. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just amazing the miracles people deliver from uh, cancer and just paralysis and all kinds of amazing things. He's a, quite a guy. But, uh, but he's very unusual. And um, so to be married to this man, is, and he has children, is a pretty interesting thing. He works at the practice. He goes in at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes he doesn't go home until 1 or 2 in the morning goes home and gets a little bit of sleep and goes right back to the office because he's, he's not only, you know, doing his regular medicine, but he's praying and he'll spend hours with people. Plus these meetings on the weekends, that he's, he's, he's an amazing guy. Just totally, I don't know if I've ever met anyone that seems so absolutely sold out to the Lord, totally wants to be invisible, but just wants to minister to people. It's just amazing to see. But uh, quick story about him. They, finally, his wife who's the funniest lady. Here's a super serious doctor, and then his wife is a nut. I mean, she's just funny, just crazy. And she finally talked um, the doctor into going on a vacation, so they went to the beach someplace, and um, 
Finally, he went out. I could just picture him. He's just kind of roly-poly, and he's bald-headed, you know, and he's just kind of chubby, and just I can just picture him in his little, uh, you know, his boxer-type swimming things, heading out into the water, you know. And uh, so he's, he goes way out. I mean, so far out that, that uh, his wife and the girls were afraid that he was going to, you know, get lost or get sucked away in the ocean or something. So he's way out there. They can hardly see him. So he comes back in and uh, came up to where the girls and his wife was and said, I lost my glasses out there, you know, little wireframe glasses. I lost my glasses out there. And they said, well, you know, there's an optometrist in town. We'll go get some. He goes, no, I'm going to go out and find them. And they go, Dad. So he turns right around and walks, you know, 100 yards out in the ocean and they're watching him going, he's so weird. Dad is so weird. And he goes back out there. I don't even know why he came in and then went back out except to tell them, I guess. So he goes out there. The water's this deep. All of a sudden, he, you know, you probably saw his little round rump come up out of the water. He goes down, and he comes up out like this with his glasses. And they just go, he's so weird. But it's just like a miracle, you know. It was a flat-out miracle. But Dr. Namie knew if, that if he went out there and reached down, he would uh, come up with his glasses. So that's not the flesh. That's as wild as the branch and the water and the axe head swimming for me. So anyhow, interesting guy. The best way out of a human mess is with a divine miracle. I wrote this in my notes. Miracles are not for reporting purposes but for redeeming purposes. In other words, when God uses you, you pray for someone, they get brand new heart and lungs. You don't just, you know, publish it on Facebook or uh, take an ad out in Charisma Magazine just to show off how the, the true, the great man of faith and power. But God does those miracles so that people's lives can be redeemed. And it's good to testify. But remember, Jesus healed a, uh, healed a blind man. He said, don't tell anybody. Healed the blind man said, don't tell anybody. He said the guy went out and told everybody. Well, Jesus, he couldn't. He was so overwhelmed at the time. Don't tell anybody. He did anyhow. So, but that guy wanted to testify what great things. But then there are other times where, uh, was it with the one leper that came back? There were 10 healed. One came back. And or maybe, I don't know, maybe it was the, the, the gathering demonized guy. But anyhow, the Lord said, go and tell people what great things the Lord has done for you. So anyhow, that's what miracles are for. Then the last one, fifth one, is that he, it said that the scripture said he put forth his hand and he took it. So this act said swimming and he reached out and grabbed it and took it. And that's something we need to do. We need to get our edge back. We need to reach in there and get it. And, you know, I guarantee you when he put that thing back on there, um, I, don't, I have the rest of this in my office. But when you put the X head on there, and then you put this wooden wedge down in and drive that thing in, it spreads this out and keeps the X head from coming out. Then you even some little metal wedges that go in and stay put. And so that thing won't come out. This one's fiberglass, so it's a little bit different. But uh, I am sure that brother hooked that X head back on there better than it ever was. He didn't want it to happen again, you know, Here's your ex, sir. Thank you for loaning it to me. Oh. <clears throat> but God's ready to make the iron swim. So where is it? Where did I lose it? I know there's more. I know there's more. I know there's more. And all of a sudden you see some iron swimming like, ooh, go take it. So I wrote this. It's about God's favor, God's power, his anointing, his grace. But there's something that we need to do. We're that inner, inner uh, interface. We may be the handle, but it's God's cutting edge that really makes it happen. I was teaching Max a little bit about tools being sharp. Is Max over there? There he is. You know, an axe that's really dull, it's just going to bounce off too. It needs to have a nice cutting edge. The reason this didn't make chips is because it's a little rotten. But... Uh, but if you have a knife, they always say, keep your knives really, really sharp. Oh, I'm afraid I'll cut myself. Well, if you don't have a sharp knife, you're going to be like this, trying to cut a tomato, and you're going, and it's squirting all over the place. It's because your knife's dull. Sharpen that bad boy up and just, just bring that thing right 
passage. You know, sharpening a knife, there could probably be a sermon in this. You know, you not only grind off the general shape, then you put it on a stone that's really, really, really fine. I mean, it's the particles in that sharpening stone are so small. It's, it feels smooth just like that, just like glass. But it's a little bit of grit, and you rub it on there and rub it on there, and it makes it even more microscopically fine on the end. And then to finish up, you strop that blade. You can even strop a, an axe blade, but like take your belt off, or you ever see the the bar, old barbers with the straight razors, they pull that leather strap and they go, tick, 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 tick. and you think, what good does that do? It's a leather strap and it's a hardened high carbon steel blade. And, you know, but like I say, I'm a fan of forge and fire. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to sharpen my little carving knife up and I'll use it on the stone and I'm going to strop it because on the back side of my stone, a little piece of leather is right off. Okay. And man, that sucker was like, whoa, I can actually shave with this thing. And so, even though it's leather, it's, it fine-tunes the edge of that edge down to a, a molecular level to where it's so sharp that it just goes in between the molecules of the tomato or whatever you're cutting. So, if it's dull, you're going to push and cut and, and whine and make a mess, but it's nice and sharp. Um, Max has been helping me at the house drill holes for wiring. I mean, probably what? 300 holes already through a two by four, a three quarter inch hole. And so uh, I bought a drill bit over at uh, Harbor Freight, which I love Harbor Freight, but they make cheap stuff. And Max, other, you know, he's makes a hole. Hey, great. Makes another hole. And after about 30 minutes, he's over going. And he's like, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm like over there pushing on his shoulder. And I, let me see that thing. And I looked at it, and the end of that, that drill bit was just round. It was like polished. It was like smooth. And it wasn't cutting any holes. So I need to sharpen it. Took it home, sharpened it, and it cut the holes, two or three of them, really quick. Next thing you knew, he was over there pushing it. And uh, the, blade, the edge was gone. It's not hardenable steel. So, you know, pitch that thing. And I went and got a good bit that's nice hard steel and that sucker it's I sharpened it once but that thing just cuts like crazy so anyhow the point is there's no effort I mean you literally get that auger started and it pulls itself right on into the wood and that's the way that the spirit of the Lord is we'll we make ourselves available you got to hold the tool up there and get it lined up but let the the power of the spirit do the work so anyhow all right well that's it well, let's uh, pray about this. Lord, here we have in this room a bunch of people that love you, and they love to watch you do miracle stuff. They love to see you do miracles, heal people. They love to see you save uh, addicts and just thugs and gangbangers and to see them transformed into wonderful uh, husbands, wives, and citizens, and we, we love that. All of us do. Lord, it's, and maybe we did a better job at some other point in our life. We want to find out where we lost the edge, where we lost the head off the axe, where we just let a few things slip, a little bit of the world come in, a little bit of distraction. Lord, help us to go back. Where did it go? On right over there. And Lord, do your miracle thing. It might be something really silly that we need to do, like throwing a little stick in. But, Lord, show each and every one. Everyone in this room is different. Whether it's an edge in their marriage, the edge in their ministry, uh, with their business, their work. They just have lost the joy of life. Or their prayers just don't seem to be fun and connecting anymore. Lord, we just want that edge back. It's so much easier. So much easier. We don't strive anymore. We're resting we can rest. You, you do more with us when we're resting in the spirit than we're striving in the flesh, so much more. So we just, just pray. Why don't each one of you just take a moment, just be quiet for a second here, and just, Lord, where did I lose it? Where did it go in the water? Where did I lose my edge? Just think about that just for a second. And Lord, we'll just keep, we'll just stay after this till we know, till we see that joy, that sparkle, that unction come back on our lives, Lord, in, in every area, Lord. So we praise you for it. 
Jesus' name. Well, amen. Hey, we're going to have ministry team, Sergio, and the team will be over here by the, the banner to pray with you. If there's anything you need from the Lord, maybe you need new heart, new lungs. God can do it. And um, we'll just believe God, not for what we do, but for what only he can do. But we'll make ourselves available, all right? Well, God bless you guys. We'll see you tonight at prayer and have a super week. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hallelujah.